like the sun that rises every day. You are so faithful, dear Lord, you are faithful like the rain that you bring. And every breath that I breathe, you are so faithful.
so because of your son Jesus how we praise you Lord and how we thank you that you have made us in your image and you have imputed your righteousness to us through your son Jesus Lord it is his name that we honor and extol and lift up today in the name of Jesus we pray amen you guys may be seated we have with us this morning Mark Eastman Dr. Mark Eastman. He is, was here with us about two years ago. Some of you remember that. Uh, he had uh, done a lecture on uh, creation, versus, creation versus evolution. He is uh, an author of a book entitled uh, In Search of Messiah. I think most of you probably have that book. And anyway, it's uh, a joy and a delight to have him with us today. So let's give him a warm welcome, if you would, please. Well, thank you. It's great to be back in Chino, my old stomping grounds. If there are any graduates of Chino High School anywhere near 1976, uh, 
I don't want to talk to you afterwards. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Please forgive me for all the uh, rude things I did when I was a non-believer. Uh, I love Jesus now. Okay. <laughs> I graduated from Chino High School, so. In fact, uh, I'm so old that I graduated. I was the, when Don Lugo High School was a single building with freshmen only, I was uh, one of the first, I was in the class that first went to Don Lugo. That was, wow, 72. So, a lot of gray hairs ago. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a second of a series of three completely different uh, lectures this morning. Uh, this one is called Emmanuel, the Transcendent One, which deals with the uh, deity and the transcendent nature of Christ. Chuck Missler and I wrote a book, is where we, I get this material from, we wrote a book called The Creator Beyond Time and Space. And in that book we have three sections, uh, evidence for the existence of God, evidence for the uh, deity and the transcendent nature of Christ and evidence for the supernatural origin of the Bible. We also did an eight-part video series at Costa Mesa uh, covering the material with all the slides and quotes that, you, that you're going to see today. And those videos are back there. They're $6 if you're interested. So, uh, I have a newsletter called the Areopagus. The Areopagus is the, uh, the uh, hill that Paul the Apostle spoke to the uh, Greeks at, called Mars Hill, where he gave reasons for the hope that was in him. Um, in this newsletter, we cover um, uh, evidence for Christianity, contemporary discoveries in archaeology and science, etc., and also things that challenge the Christian faith as well. So if you're interested, you can sign up for that. It's free back there. Um, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get the lights down. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to serve you, to learn of you in this place. We thank you for providing this place for us, Lord, that we can sit at your feet, Lord, and just be amazed by who you are and what you've done. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. A while back, somebody sent me this uh, interesting email that I want to read to you. It says, why do you need a driver's license to buy liquor when you can't drink and drive? Why isn't phonetic spelled the way it sounds? Why are there interstate highways in Hawaii? Why are there flotation devices under airplane seats instead of parachutes? Good question. Why are cigarettes sold in gas stations when smoking is prohibited there? <laughs> Do you need a silencer if you're going to shoot a mime? Have you ever imagined a world with no hypothetical situations? How does the guy who drives the snowplow get to work in the mornings? <laughs> If 7-Eleven is open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, why are there locks on the doors? If a cow... <laughs> you like that one, huh? It gets better. If a cow laughed, would milk come out of her nose? <laughs> if nothing ever sticks to Teflon, how do they make the Teflon stick to the pan? Here's one of my favorites. If you tied buttered toast to the back of a cat and dropped the cat from a height, what would happen? Not a couple people get that one. Okay, there's this, there's a, there's this uh, saying. There's a saying that if you take buttered toast and you drop it, it'll always land buttered side down. Okay? If you take a cat and drop it, it always lands on its feet. Well, what happens if you tie buttered toast to the back of the cat the butter facing up, and you drop the whole thing. Which way is it going to land? Okay. <laughs> if you're landing, if you're uh, if you're uh, in a vehicle going the speed of light, what happens when you turn on the headlights? Whoa. <laughs> you know how most packages say "open here." What is the protocol if the package says "open somewhere else"? And here's one of my favorites. Why do they put braille dots on the keypad of drive-up ATMs? <laughs> uh, 
why do we park, why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways? Why is it that when you transport something by car, it's called a shipment, but when you transport something by ship, it's called cargo? <laughs> uh, and you know that little indestructible black box that is used on airplanes? Why can't they just make the whole plane out of that stuff? <laughs> uh, and this is one of my favorites. This is what my, what my wife does this. Don't, don't tell her I told you, though. It's, it says, why is it when you're driving and looking for an address, you turn down the volume on the radio? <laughs> uh, does anybody here do that? I've done that before. <laughs> uh, I caught myself doing that the other day, and I just started laughing. Well, these are what we would call mysteries or, or paradoxes. And what we're going to look at this morning is the greatest paradox of all. And that is the mystery of God. The mystery of God. And the mystery of God in the person of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, verses 16 through 13, it says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others... Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, and he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus asked the question, Who do you say that I am? Now this was the easiest test the disciples had ever had. Because he said, he said to them, he says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He gave him the answer. The Son of Man is a term for the Messiah, for the Christ, the anointed one that was awaited by the nation of Israel. And it's a title that you see in Daniel uh, chapter 7. They said during the time of Jesus, some said he was Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist, risen from the dead or one of the prophets. Most people during the time of Jesus in Jerusalem had an opinion about who he was. The Pharisees said that he was a devil that he did his works by the power of Beelzebub, the lord of those who fly. Beelzebub, the devil. It's one of the names for Satan. Some said that he was a good man, just a good man, but not the Messiah. And Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? When I, when I was a little boy, my grandmother and my mother sat me down and told me that Jesus was the son of God, the very creator of the universe who became flesh and tabernacled among us, and that the Bible was the word of God. I was told that he created me. By the time I got into about fourth or fifth grade uh, in the Chino Unified School District, back in uh, 19, what are we talking, 1967, 68, I was told that I'm not the product of God. I was shown a little chart with a furry little ape guy dragging his knuckles on one end, who got taller and taller, lost his hair, and walked off the end of the page, a fully evolved man. And I was told that I was the product of evolution, the product of chance, that I had got here, that a lightning bolt struck the primordial goo, and I had evolved from the goo through the zoo to you over three and a half billion years. <laughs> well, all of my teachers, most of my teachers, I uh, hope none of them are here this morning. <laughs> Most of my teachers pumped evolution into me, through even in social studies classes and, uh, you know, of course, all through science. And by the time I graduated from high school, I was a convinced evolutionist. And at the age of 17, a neighbor friend of mine who was Jewish told me that Jesus of Nazareth was a myth, a non-historical myth, that he never existed, that the only place you can find evidence for Jesus is in the writings of the New Testament. You see, 12 bored Jewish guys got together uh, 2,000 years ago and made up the whole story of this, you know, suntan carpenter with a lamb wa uh, wrapped around his neck. That the whole story was a myth. And I thought, well, it works for me. Graduated from, went to college, graduated from college, then went on to medical school, uh, finished my medical training, and was challenged by some Christian physicians to search the evidence 
and answer the question for myself, who do you say that I am? And what I found is just staggering. Back in uh, 1994, in December, Life magazine answered, asked the question, who was he? Cover story, 1994, December. To answer this question, they interviewed a bunch of atheists and agnostics and scientists and a um, uh, couple of a uh, li- bunch of liberal theologians and I think a token uh, Christian or two to ask them their opinion uh, on the question of who was Jesus. Well, they went to an excellent source of religious information, John Murray, president of the American Atheist Society. And he said this about Jesus. He says, there was no such person in the history of the world as Jesus Christ. There was no, li- no historical, living, breathing, sentient human being by that name. Ever. The Bible is a fictional, non-historical narrative, and the myth is good for business. That's one man's answer to the question, who do you say that I am? And they went to Barbara Thiering, a lady who's an expert in the area of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and she said this, it is in the scrolls if you really study the codes. It was not a resurrection. He was put on the cross. Those with his own party trying to help him to commit suicide. They gave him poison, a sponge dipped in vinegar. He was unconscious, but not dead. His side was pierced, and blood came out. A dead body does not bleed. So his followers knew that he was not dead. They put him in a cave. He lived until his 70s. And it was he, Jesus, acting behind Paul, who led their party out of Judaism and to Rome. He married Mary Magdalene and had four children. Where do they get this stuff? They must sit around and think, okay, who can make up the wildest story today about Jesus, you know? How about this? How about this? You know? I mean, it's insane. So Life magazine let this kind of expression out about the question of who was Jesus. But what I noticed about the article was they never bothered to ask Jesus himself or the disciples himself. Who are you? Well, they didn't look at his own claims or the claims of the disciples. And what I'd like to do this morning is look at some of those claims. Some of them you know quite well. Others might be a little bit surprising to you. And let the Bible, the New Testament, answer the question, who do you say that I am? When I was studying the issue of Jesus Christ, the first thing I had to do was to find out if he was really real. I had been told at the age of 17 that he was a non-historical myth that he'd been made up by these Jewish men 2,000 years ago. Well, it turns out when you look at the writings of the ancient Jews and the writings of the ancient Romans, you find that indeed Jesus is referred to many times in their writings. In fact, in uh, the uh, first century, there was a Jewish man named Josephus who uh, was a Jewish man. He grew up in um, in a family of Levitical priests, it's believed, um, uh, uh, so he had wore Levi jeans. He, he, had, he had Levi jeans. Uh, he was a, he was a Levite. And uh, during uh, during about the year A.D. 68, just before the destruction of the temple, Josephus was commissioned by the Roman government to write uh, an account of the events going on in the first century A.D. And in one of his documents called The Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, Chapter 3, he said this. He said, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. He was the Christ. Some versions say he was the so-called Christ. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. So here we have a first century man who we know did not become a Christian from, there's no evidence that Josephus ever became a Christian, who refers to the existence of Jesus. He also refers in his other writings to the existence of John the Baptist and to the brothers of Jesus and to the early church, the early uh, first century followers. So here's a very good historical source that indeed proves that Jesus was a historical figure. Another excellent place to look is in the writings of the ancient rabbis themselves. There is a document called the Babylonian Talmud, which was written from about the 2nd century to the 5th century A.D., two to 500 years after Jesus was crucified. 
And in that document, there's 69 volumes. There are tons of writings about commentaries on the Bible, commentaries on Jewish history, commentaries on social life, as well as biblical interpretation. And in this document, the Babylonian Talmud, it's, it's primarily written by um, rabbis who were, who were heads of the rabbinical academies. They make numerous references in the Babylonian Talmud to the person of Jesus of Nazareth. In the uh, Sanhedrin, I believe it's in uh, tract 43a, it says this. It has been taught on the eve of the Passover, they hanged Yeshua. And an announcer went out in front of him for 40 days saying, he is going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and led and uh, enticed and led Israel astray. Anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and plead in his behalf. But not having found anything in his favor, they hanged him on the eve of the Passover. So this is the writings of ancient rabbis between the 2nd and 5th century. They document the historical existence of Jesus, the fact that he performed supernatural miracles, which they attribute to Satan, and the fact that he was crucified on the eve of the Passover. Now you can't argue that this is a biased source because these are rabbis. They despised Christians. They absolutely despised the Christians in the 2nd and 5th century. So the idea that, that Jesus is a myth it's just a myth. He really did exist. He was a true historical being. Easy, easy to prove. If you want to read a really good book on that, I would recommend Josh McDowell's book, um, He Walked Among Us. It's about 300 pages thick, filled with historical evidence of, of the existence of Jesus and proof of his messiahship. Now let's look, look at some of the claims of Jesus' disciples. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 41 through 43, we read about the encounter of Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. Mary has been told by the Holy Spirit that she has been conceived and she's going to bear the Messiah. She gets up immediately and she goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. And we read in the Gospel of Luke, verse chapter 1, verse 41 through 43, about the encounter. It says, And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then she says this. This is Elizabeth speaking to Mary. But why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. The mother of my Lord. Elizabeth recognized that that baby growing inside that womb was the very creator of the universe and her very Lord. It's incredible. Now, she apparently taught her son well, because John the Baptist, the one that was doing backflips inside of her womb when uh, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, in all four Gospels was asked, Who are you? Are you the Messiah? And he said, No, I'm not. Are you Elijah? And he says, No, I'm not. Who are you? And in John chapter 1, verse 23, we read John the Baptist's answer to the question of who he was. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. And then he says this, As the prophet Isaiah said, now, John the Baptist is saying, I am the voice of the one going before the Lord. And he says he's quoting the book of Isaiah. When you go to the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, you find this verse. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah was saying that there's going to come a person in the future who's going to go before the Lord, prepare his way, and make straight the highway for this person. Now, who is the person that this, this guy is going to be going for before? It's the Lord. You see there in the, um, if you, when you look in your English Bible, you'll see the word capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D, all four capitals. That is the English translation for the holiest name of God, which is Yahweh. It's the voice of it's the it's the it's the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. Now, 
This says that the one coming is going to be preparing the way of the Lord and make straight his path. And what did John the Baptist say? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Then he goes on. John the Baptist goes on. He does it three times. He points to Jesus of Nazareth and says, it is he of whom I spoke, he of whom I'm not worthy to lose his sandal straps. Read John 1 very carefully, and you will see that John the Baptist is applying this Old Testament verse to the person of Jesus of Nazareth. John the Baptist believed that Jesus and Yahweh, the one that Isaiah said he would go before, were one and the same incredible. In 1 Timothy 3.16, we read Paul the Apostle writing his opinion about Jesus Christ. He says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, much greater than the mystery of whether a cat or the toast will land down on the bed. God was manifested, look at this, God was manifested in the flesh. God, manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory? It's obvious that Paul the Apostle believed that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed God in the flesh who was received up in glory. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we read again the words of Paul the Apostle, speaking to the church, he says, take heed, he says, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. When did God purchase the church with his own blood? Jesus, speaking of the Father, said that God is spirit. But the Bible teaches that Jesus and God are one. And so he could be speaking of no other person than of Jesus Christ. God, Jesus, God in Jesus, Jesus as God, shed his own blood and purchased the church with that blood. Finally, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul the Apostle said this. He said, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you read this cursorily, Quickly, cursory. We do a cursory reading of this. Hope my English teachers are not in the class now. If you read a, do a cursory reading of this, you'll miss an incredible insight. Paul the Apostle is quoting again the Old Testament, an Old Testament scripture which is applying to Jesus Christ. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 23, again we have Yahweh speaking, the Lord Yahweh. The holiest name of God is speaking. And he, Yahweh says, I, Yahweh, have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. Paul the Apostle says every knee is going to take an oath to Jesus and every knee is going to bow to Jesus, and yet here's Yahweh himself in the Old Testament saying that every knee is going to bow to me. So either Jesus and Yahweh are one and the same, or we've got a major contradiction in the Bible. Indeed, these are proofs that Paul the Apostle believed that Jesus of Nazareth was literally God manifested in the flesh. Now, regarding Jesus, Peter said in Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31 this, he said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
Throughout the New Testament, Jesus is called the Savior. When the shepherds were out in the field and the uh, angel went to do the announcement of the birth of Christ, he said, hey guys, i got great news. Behold, born to you this day in the city of David is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So Jesus is called the Savior throughout the New Testament. Well, we've got a problem. And that is in Isaiah 43, verse 11, Yahweh, there it is again, capital L-O-R-D, says, I, even I, am Yahweh, and besides me there is no Savior. Wait a minute. The New Testament says Jesus is the Savior. The Old Testament says it's Yahweh. Either Jesus, Yahshua HaMashiach, Yahshua, that Jesus' name Yahshua means Jehovah, Shua, God our Savior, either Jesus and Yahweh are one, or we've got another humongous contradiction in the Bible. It's clear that Jesus must be God, because they kept calling him names and titles which were belong to God alone. Now let's look at the actions of the disciples. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14, we read the story of Jesus walking on the water. The disciples are out in the boat. Jesus decides to take a shortcut. And he walks across the water, and they see him, and they get freaked out, thinking it's a ghost. And Jesus says, no, guys, it's me, it's me. And then Peter comes out, and he wants to walk on the water. So he comes out, and he starts walking on the water. And then he takes his eyes off the Lord, and he starts to sink. Well, you know why Peter sank? Well, first of all, he took his eyes off the Lord. But did you know what Peter's name means? Peter means rock. <laughs> no wonder he sunk. The guy was a rock. So Peter sinks, they get back <laughs> they get back in the boat, and in Matthew chapter 14, 33, they're drying off, and it says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So here they are, they got their faces down. The word worshipped here is the word proskuneo in the Greek. It means prostrate to bow down before and to kiss at the feet of someone. So here they are. They got their faces on the bottom of a dirty, fishy, smelling, stinky, you know, boat. Holy, you are the son of God. And they're down there on the bottom of the boat, and they're worshiping him. Now, the problem is, is that in the, in, oops, oh, no, this, this is the right verse. The question is, why did they worship him? Well, Job chapter 9, verse 8, gives us an idea of why they worshiped him. Job this book was written 4,000 years ago. It's the oldest book in the Bible. Speaking about God, Job says, He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Job says only God can tread. And the word in Hebrew literally means to st stand upon or walk upon. Only God has the capability of walking on the sea. So they see Jesus Christ walking across the water and this they, they knew the Bible. These guys had been read the Bible ever since they were little. They knew that according to the book of Job, only God could walk on the water. And that's why they worshiped Jesus. Is that a cool verse or what? I found this verse by accident one day. I was searching for something else and the Lord showed me this. Only God can tread on the waves of the sea. Now, the problem with all this worship stuff is found in Deuteronomy 8.19. In Deuteronomy 8.19, God tells the people that if you worship anything other than me, you're dead. Then it's, it says this, Deuteronomy 8.19, Then it shall be, if you by any means forget Yahweh, your God, and follow other gods, and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. So the disciples knew that in worshiping Jesus, if he wasn't God, then they were toast. They were going to be toasted, man, because they knew that only God could receive worship. And yet, they readily worshiped Jesus. In fact, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, when they got to this word worship, they used a word, which is the Greek word prostrate, which is the same thing that the disciples did to Jesus. They prostrated themselves before him literally worship. So it's the same idea, to worship, especially worshiping in the sense of worshiping God. So these guys worshiped Jesus as God. They claimed he was God. They gave him titles of God. They worshiped him as God, knowing that if he wasn't God, 
they would perish. Now let's look at some of the claims of Jesus. In John chapter 4, we read the story of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, a Samaritan. She points out, you know, why are you talking to me? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Samaritans, being half-breeds, were despised by the Jews. And this woman, of course, women were also despised by the male leadership and the Jews as well, but this woman had three things against her. She was a Samaritan, she was a woman, and the third thing was, was she was a sinner. She'd had five husbands, and the man she was living with, she was not married to. And Jesus showed her this knowledge, and she obviously you know, was blown away by it. And in John chapter 4, we read the encounter in verse 25, where she says this, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Messiah is the word which means the anointed one, and Christ is the Greek translation of the word Messiah. She says, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And it says this, and Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, there are people that actually say, liberal theologians will claim that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Well, here it is. She says, I know Messiah, who is called Christ, is coming. And he says, I who speak to you am he. So what's neat about this, I think, is that this woman was like, in, in her day, like the scum of the earth. I mean, she was horribly looked down upon. In fact, she had to go at noontime to get water because she couldn't go in the morning because she was so despised probably by the people. All the husbands that she'd had and now living in sin. And yet Jesus of Nazareth, the creator of the universe, has an appointment with her. Someone who was despised and rejected by the world, Jesus Christ, came to another person who was despised and rejected by the world. And he told her, the first person that he told, that he was the Messiah. That shows the grace of God and that God does hang out with sinners. And I am glad about that. In John chapter 9, verses 35 through 37, we read the story of a man who'd been blind from birth. This man had been blind from birth. His parents verified it, and Jesus healed him. After he was healed, the Pharisees asked him, Who healed you? And he says it was this guy, Jesus. And they kicked him out of the temple. And in John chapter 9, 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Some people say Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. There are liberal theologians all around the world who say, Oh, he never claimed that. Oh, here he claimed to be the Son of God, and in John chapter 4 he claimed to be the Messiah. I don't know how they come up with these conclusions. But here he is declaring that he was the very Son of God. Now, in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, he made one of the most radical claims about his person. One day I had some Jehovah's Witnesses that came to my uh, door. And um, after I showed them this verse, they painted that invisible black X you know, in front of my house, and they won't come talk to me anymore. I said, they were, they were giving me their spiel and telling me that I needed to awake, you know, Awake Magazine. And, and I was like, you know, listening to them for a minute. And I said, tell me, I said, who, who, who uh, raised Jesus from the dead? And they said, well, God did. And I said, you're right. I said, let's go to John chapter 2. So I had the apprentice of the two. They always come in pairs. Um, the apprentice, I had her open her own Bible. And I said, turn to John chapter 2 for me. And I had her read this, John chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, uh, this is where the, Jesus was looking at the, um, at the buildings, the temple and the great buildings. It says, Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And then the writer of the Gospel of John puts this very important statement in there. He says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And I looked at her and I said, well, I said, um, 
what does that say? And she says, it, it can't be. It, can, it can't be. That's not right. It, it can't be. And I said, you're right. I said, take the words temple of his body and put it back up into a statement. Destroy the temple of my body, and in three days I will raise it up. And she says, that's not possible. Only God can raise the dead. And I said, you're right. Here's God saying he's going to raise himself from the dead. And I said, what's the answer? And her, and the apprentice, and the elder lady, they said they would get back to me, and that was 15 months ago. <laughs> they haven't come back. And now the problem is I've moved since then. But they still, they had about a year and two months uh, to get back to me, and they never did. They wouldn't even give me their phone number so that I could call them to get the answer to this question. Jesus declaring that he has the power to raise himself from the dead. Well, he also echoed this in John chapter 10. He was speaking about his coming uh, crucifixion to his disciples, and he said this in John chapter 10, 18. He said, no one, speaking of his life, he said, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it again, meaning take it up again. I have received this commandment from my Father. Notice he didn't say I've received the power from my Father. I received the commandment from my Father. Now, Jesus is saying that I have the ability to exit this body right now. He can, I can spiritually separate my spirit from this body, and this body can just go boom, to the ground if I wanted to. But I also have the ability to resurrect myself. I showed this verse to them also, and by then... You ever, you ever had a hard drive failure on your computer where, you know, the lights are on? It's like you get the little unhappy, you know, you know, question mark. Well, that's what happened with these ladies. They were like, uh, we'll get back to you. They didn't know what to do because Jesus is declaring he had the power to raise himself from the dead. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, we read the story of the temptation of Christ. We're told in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus was led up to the wilderness by the Spirit. Jesus was led to be tempted by the devil. And then we read about the three temptations. In the third temptation, we read that the devil took Jesus to the top, to the pinnacle of the temple. And while he was up on the top of the temple, the devil says, I dare you to throw yourself down. I dare you to jump off the temple. Because it's written that God will send his angels to catch you lest you dash your foot against the stone. So the devil is tempting Jesus. And Jesus' response, Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, he says to him, It is written again, you shall not tempt who? The Lord your God. Now, Jesus here is declaring his deity to Satan, I believe. Because Jesus is the one being, being uh, tempted. Now, I always used to think that Jesus was... I read this verse many times, and I, I think I read it wrong many times. I always read it as Satan was tempting God to dare him to send angels to catch his son. But I think this has a dual fulfillment, actually, a dual meaning. Jesus is literally saying to Satan, You shall not tempt who? The Lord your God. This is where he declares his deity to Satan. In John chapter 17, verse 5, in John chapter 17, we read Jesus praying for himself. He's, he knows he's about ready to go to the cross. He knows he's about ready to be separated from the Father, something that had never happened before in eternity. And he's praying for himself. In John chapter 17, 5, he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you, before the world that is the cosmos was. So Jesus is saying, Father, glorify me with the glory that you and I shared before the creation of the universe. Give me back that glory that I had that shared with you jointly before the creation of the universe. So Jesus declares he had the very glory of God before the creation of the universe. Well, there's a problem with that because in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, it says this, I am Yahweh, L-O-R-D, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. Either Jesus and Yahweh are one and the same, or we have another humongous contradiction. 
Obviously, Jesus and, and Yahweh were one in the same. In John chapter 14, verse 9, we read the story of Philip. He's getting blown away by the claims of Jesus, and Philip basically says, Hey, I'd, if you're the Son of God, I'd like to see the Father. Can you show us the Father? And the response in John chapter 14, 9 is this. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been with you so long? Have, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast Philip, he that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, let's say that you and I are getting to be friends, and after a few visits, I'm, we're chatting about our home lives and how we grew up and all that, and, and you say to me, you know, Mark, I'd really like to meet your father. And I'm sitting there at the table, and I lean forward, and I give you a confused look, and I say, Have I been with you so long, and you have not known me? He who hath seen me hath seen my father. Okay? There's a couple options here. Okay? <laughs> a, I'm a raving lunatic. Okay? Option one. Or B, in seeing me, you really literally are seeing an equivalent of my father, which obviously I can't do that as a human, but Jesus being a transcendent being who existed before time and space, who existed before creation, who was one with the father in glory, he has the titles of God, by literally, by, by looking at Jesus, he says we are literally seeing a physical manifestation of God, his father. In Revelation chapter 17, 14, we see an incredible title applied to Jesus. It says, of course, one of the names of the Messiah in the New Testament is the Lamb of God. And John writing says in Revelation 17, 14, he says, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. 
For he, the Lamb, is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Now, we have another problem. And that is in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, it says, for, there it is again, Yahweh, capital O, capital R, capital O, capital capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, L-O-R-D, for Yahweh your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. The New Testament says Jesus is the Lord of lords. And the Old Testament says only Yahweh is the Lord of lords. Again, another proof text that either the Bible's all messed up and there's a huge contradiction, or Jesus and Yahweh are one and the same. In John 8, 58, Jesus makes an incredible claim to the Pharisees. He's having kind of an in-your-face discussion with the Pharisees about himself. He's testifying of himself and making claims that was really ticking these guys off, basically. And in John chapter 8, verse 58, it says this, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was I am. Ego imi in the Greek. Now the problem with this statement is, is it was a tradition in Judaism that you never took the words I am and applied them to yourself because the name I am, that title I am, was the name that God gave to Moses when Moses was speaking to the burning bush. He's talking to this bush is burning and Moses is going, okay, great, wait a minute, let me think. Okay, I'm talking to a bush and it's burning and it's not getting consumed. And this bush is telling me i got to go tell three million people all of this stuff. And Moses who says, who shall I say sent me? <laughs> and the bush says, tell them that I am sent you. Imagine that. Imagine having to go down and look these people in the face and say, well, here's how it went, folks. I was talking to this bush, and it was burning. <laughs> okay, right. <clears throat> Call the rubber duck squad. Moses has lost it. Well, the very name of God, I am is what Jesus was applying to himself. How do we know that? Well, in the very next verse, it says, John 8, 59, the, rabbi, the, the Jews who were there, the Pharisees, it says, then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They wanted to kill Jesus for saying, before Abraham was, ego imi, I am applying that title to himself. That was blasphemy, and they knew it. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups say that Jesus is not God. Well, why did the Pharisees want to kill Jesus? <laughs> the answer is right here. In John chapter 10, verse 30 through 33, Jesus makes an incredible claim. He says, I and my Father are one. And the Jews took up stones again to stone him. How many times did they do that? Five, six, seven times? And Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews knew that Jesus was continually acting in ways and making claims and doing things that, and, and applying titles to himself that were clearly reserved for God. And they wanted to kill him for making his claim, making, making claims of deity. Why is it that Jehovah's Witnesses and so many other groups can't see that that's why they wanted to kill him? You being a man, make yourself God is why they wanted to kill him. Now let's look at some of the actions of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 5, we read the story of the disciples of John the Baptist coming to Jesus. John the Baptist is in jail, and he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And in this particular section, it says this, Matthew 11, 4 through 5, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. He didn't say, go and tell John. Yeah, go, go tell John I'm the Messiah. 
Go tell him I'm the coming one, I'm the Messiah. He didn't do that. He said, go and tell John the things that you see, hear and see. Number one, the blind receive their sight. Number two, the lame walk. Number three, the lepers are cleansed. Number four, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. Number five, and just for free, he threw in another one. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, why did Jesus tell them this? Well, it turns out that during the second temple period, the second temple, remember, was destroyed in 70 AD. During the second temple period, there was a tradition that teams of rabbis used to go out into the community. And they would go out in pairs, and they would go to the various cities in Judea, and they would anoint people who were sick with oil, and they would pray for them. And the rabbis, used through the Spirit of God, were actually able to heal various sicknesses. But there were several things the rabbis could not do. The rabbis could not heal a blind person, a deaf person, a lame person. They could not heal a leper, and they could not raise a dead person from the dead. So a tradition developed that when the Messiah came, these would be the things that the Messiah would do. So the disciples of John come to Jesus, and they say, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus says, go and tell John things you see and hear. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised up, and he'll know who I am. He went back, they went back to John, and I'm sure when they told John that, he had Jesus bumps three inches high on his neck and forearm. My God, he is the Messiah. He's doing the very works that we, our rabbis, have been expecting the Messiah to do. This man is the Messiah. So Jesus was able to defy the laws of physics and chemistry by doing these things. Now, this is a fun one. I always like showing this one. In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11, we read the story of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and he's spending time with his disciples, and he's teaching them, and he's saying, go into all the world and make disciples of, of all men. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, it says this, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, while they were still looking at him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And then they put in this excellent verse, which helps us. It says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from where? From the mount called Olivet, which is, a, is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So here's the picture. They're standing on the Mount of Olives. Jesus, with his feet on the Mount of Olives, ascends into a cloud. And the angel says, he gets taken out of their sight, the angel says, why are you standing here gazing, guys? This same Jesus is going to come back in like manner. So if we reverse the picture, we see that Jesus is going to come out of a cloud, which is what Daniel chapter 7 says, and he'll come down to earth, and he's going to put his feet where? On the Mount of Olives. Now, when we go to the Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah, we get a clarification of who this Jesus was. In Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4, we read about the end times, the coming of the Lord. And it says this, then shall the Lord, there's Yahweh again, then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as, those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. Now listen to this. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Yahweh has got feet? His feet, Yahweh, will manifest in time and space with feet and stand on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley. Is that incredible? The New Testament says that Jesus is going to come down with his feet again and put his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Old Testament says that it's Yahweh who's coming. Yahweh with feet. 
Yahweh plus feet equals Jesus, okay? It's a simple math formula, all right? You can teach that to your kids, all right? I showed this to the Jehovah's Witnesses again. They just shook their heads and said, well, uh, we want to talk to you about blood transfusions. I said, no, I don't want to talk about blood transfusions. I'm a doctor. I give blood transfusions all the time. Get away from me. Let's talk about Jesus. They did not like this verse. They were irritated. The Bible says that Yeshua, Jehovah, Yahweh, Shua, God our Savior, is coming back with feet, and he's going to step on the Mount of Olives. Now let's look at the Old Testament, and we'll finish up. The Bible clearly in the New Testament proclaims that Jesus Christ has the nature of God. He is the attributes of God, the names of God, the works of God, etc. are all applied to the person and identity of Jesus Christ. When we go to the Old Testament, we also see hints throughout the Old Testament that indeed the Messiah would be literally God in the flesh. In Isaiah 7.14, written seven centuries before Jesus was born, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel in Hebrew means God with us. So the Messiah, a virgin is going to conceive, conceive and bear a son who will literally be God with us. God manifested in time and space with feet who is going to walk among us. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. In the Hebrew, it's El Gibor, God the Mighty, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. So a human being born into the world will have these titles applied to him, and among them is the Mighty God and the Everlasting Father which is an idiom for the name of God. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, written again seven centuries before Jesus was born, it said, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Well, this verse says that a human being is going to be born into the world as a descendant of King David. He's going to accomplish these things, and he's going to be called what? You look at the original Hebrew in Jeremiah, it's Yahweh, our righteousness. So we see hint after hint after hint that the Messiah would in some way be Yahweh. The ancient rabbis, in one of their commentaries called the Midrash on Lamentations 1.16, asked the question, what is the name of King Messiah? Rabbi Abba, son of Kahana, said, Jehovah, for it is written, this is his name, whereby he shall be called Jehovah, our righteousness. So at least one ancient rabbi believed that the name of the Messiah would be Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4, we read what is called the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's the cry of every Jew today. But yet, hidden within this verse is an interesting textual proof that God is indeed a plural being. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When Moses wrote this verse, he used the word Echad for the word one. The word Echad is a compound unity. It is a word which means one, but it's a one which is made up of more than one part. It's the same word that the Bible used when it said that a man shall leave his parents and cleave unto his wife and there should become echad, one flesh. So it's a compound unity. There is another word in Hebrew, which is an indivisible, absolute one, and that's called yachid. And Moses didn't use that word. He used it echad. So we get a hint here that indeed, although there is one God, he is in some ways a compound unity. One God, but made up of more than one part in effect. Now, I can't explain the Trinity to you, so don't 
ask me. I'm, I'm, no human being can explain the Trinity. Finally, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, in Young's literal translation, we see another hint of the plural nature of God. It says, this is a literal rendition of the Hebrew. It says, remember also thy creators in the days of thy youth, while that evil days come not, nor the years have arrived, that thou sayest, I have no pleasure in them. Remember also thy creators. Now, obviously, there is only one God, but that one God is a plural being who has manifested himself, according to the Bible, as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God manifested in three persons. And the Hebrew here indicates that there's a plurality of creators in effect. Now, let's look at the attributes of the Messiah, Jesus. According to the Bible, he's eternally existent. In John 1, it says that the creation of the universe, in the, in, in the beginning was the Word. When the universe was created, the, Jesus already existed. He's eternally existed. Also, Micah 5.2 says it is he who comes from everlasting. He's independent of the space-time domain. He's a transcendent being. Jesus uh, existed before time and space. When the universe was created, he entered time and space. If you want to hear more about this, I did this in the first service. Um, He's omniscient, according to the New Testament, omnipresent. He's able to supersede the laws of physics by resurrection, walking on the water, and healing the sick. According to the New Testament, he's the creator of the universe in Colossians 1 and John 1. He, uh, he resurrected himself, according to John 2, as we saw in John uh, 10, 17, and 18. Uh, he resurrects mankind, according to John 5.21, and John 6.40, and John 6.54. His omniscience, Revelation 2.23, and his omnipresence, Matthew 18.20. Jesus said that after the resurrection, he said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst. So he's an omnipresent being. Now, when Jesus came, they knew the scripture. They knew the entire resume of the Messiah. They knew it. They wrote about it. They taught about it. But one of the ironic things, the greatest irony of all, the greatest mystery of all, is that even the, res the uh, rejection and the death of Jesus was foretold before he came. In Isaiah 8, verse 14, 700 years before Jesus was born, it said this. Speaking of the Messiah, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, and as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It foretold that when he came, they would stumble over him. They wouldn't know what to do with him. They would stumble, and he would snare them. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter said this. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus alone, he said. And finally, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am not one of many ways, me and Buddha and Allah and Muhammad, Blah, 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 you know, Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> I'm not one of many ways. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Is that narrow? Absolutely it's narrow. Did it offend me? Absolutely it offended me. It offends my, in fact, it still offends my intellect. But in my spirit, I know that it's true. Because Jesus has been proven to be the Messiah, proven to be God in the flesh, as we've seen. And his claim is that no one comes to the Father but by me. Now he asked the question, who do you say that I am? There's only four possibilities. One possibility is he's a legend. He never existed. Well, we disproved that by looking at the ancient writings. One possibility is that he wasn't the Messiah, and he wasn't the Son of God, and he wasn't God in the flesh, but he thought he was. What does that make him? makes him a lunatic. I mean, 
he wasn't the son of God, but he went around, come on to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He'd make all these claims. And he was a lunatic. He really wasn't the Messiah. He really wasn't the son of God, but he thought he was. That makes him a lunatic. Well, how about the next option? He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't God in the flesh. And he knew it. He knew he wasn't. And he went around telling everybody who he, that all these claims about himself. He who hath seen me hath seen the Father. And all these things. And what does that make him? It makes him a liar. It makes him a devil. Or option number four, he was who he said he was. He was who the disciples said he was. And that makes him the Lord of the universe and the very creator of you and me. The one who's holding your very molecular structure together today and allowing you to breathe to hear this message. Those are the four options. And he says to you, who do you say that I am? The decision that you make about that will not affect Jesus' eternal destiny, but it will affect yours. Because he said, if you, unless you come through me, that narrow gate, you will not enter in. If you die today and you find yourself going through a really wide gate with a whole bunch of people, <laughs> I got news for you. That's the wrong gate. Because Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to not life. And the gate's narrow, and few there are that find it. Christians are peculiar people. We believe a very peculiar message, that the way to salvation is narrow. Who do you say that I am? He asked. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the incredible, incredible evidence that you've given us, Lord, that indeed Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, everlasting father, mighty God, the prince of peace, the great I am, ego imi, Lord. We praise you, Lord, for revealing this to us, that indeed you, God, stepped into time and space and manifested yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, and that you have paid the penalty th for our sins, and that if we simply believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, that we can have eternal life and salvation with you in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for these truths, and we thank you, Lord, that, that it's so re believable and so rational, and that the proof is everywhere, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you bless this day and give us the power and the strength to teach these things to a non-believing world, to a world that is really hurting out there, Lord to a world that believes in all kinds of crazy things, Lord. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.